Okay, everybody, I think we're going to pull together our cheery, smaller crowd here. Um, uh, all right, so, Kristen, are we, are we ready? Anytime. Can we see anytime? Okay, well, good morning. A, everyone must be in their garden here on this uh, lusty first, uh, feels like, like first day of spring here. Um, Welcome, I'm Philip Music. I work at the MPCA and I'm the Green Step Coordinator along with Abby Finnis here. Um, so uh, welcome to our last welcome uh, webinar participant. Um, so this is our last workshop. We uh, will resume in September or maybe October. We, we, um, we haven't decided. We have a ton of possible workshops for, uh, for next year. Uh, our, uh, fall, winter, spring workshop session will begin. Uh, so this is our last one, so great you can uh, make it. Thanks again to uh, Siemens and the McKnight Flores here from uh, Siemens Corporation and the McKnight Foundation for and LMC for providing the space for these workshops, which are recorded. So um, the um, uh, video of our presentation, handouts, um, PowerPoints are, will be stored on the um, uh, workshop page uh, after this uh, this event, so uh, so I'd, I'd like to go around and do introductions. So uh, why don't you tell us your name, your organization, and the since we're we're talking about walkability, the classic question would be, um, uh, is it uh, is it possible? Can you do you uh, walk from your house to buy a quart of milk, um, half and half for your coffee, tea bags? You know, can you uh, can you walk out of your house? Um, for a quart of milk. So, um, well, so I'll start. So, uh, so I live a, in an old, uh, really, a, it was a street streetcar sort of suburb, sewer neighborhood of, of Minneapolis. A streetcar terminated uh, a couple blocks from my house. There, uh, there used to be 22. My neighbor talked about um, delivering bread to 22 little corner stores uh, or little funky little retail stores that also had had bread and a few things. I can walk up to a cafe four, three, four blocks away, maybe 12, 30. yeah, so I can walk, but you know, it's like a 15 minute walk, so perfect for a bike ride. Um, so that's my, and you know, just luck of the draw, you know, where I found a place to rent. So, um, Kristen. Hi, I'm Kristen Peterson. I work at Great Plains Institute and I can walk to find a gallon of milk or something. Um, the co-op is also about 15 minutes away. So it's a, it's an adventure, but it's definitely walkable. Okay. Hi, my name is Gary Gustafson. I work with Sustainable Energy and I live in a walkable neighborhood. I live by Lake Area. So you can get around and bike, bike your grocery stores. Okay. Hi, I'm Paul Dronos with the uh, Red Wing Sustainability Commission. And uh, Red Wings an 1857 town, so it was designed for walkability. And the bluffs kind of keep people toward centralized, but of course, not everybody lives downtown. Yeah. Okay. Laura. Uh, my name is Laura Mollis. I'm with Siemens Building Performance and Sustainability Group. And um, I would say our neighborhood's pretty walkable. Um, I don't know if I can walk. Um, Anyway, let's just put it this way. It's, it's closer for me to walk to get a pint of beer than it is to get ah. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> How could I forget the beer? <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Used to be the beverage of choice 100, 200 thousand years ago. <laughs> Very good. I'm Danielle Cabot. I'm with the League of Minnesota City. Um, I actually live about a mile from here, so I say I can walk to work, and I'm committed to doing that this summer. Oh. Um, we have a, a snap mart around the corner where I can get basic groceries pretty easily. Um, and we can also access a number of um, Asian markets in a couple of blocks. Uh, great. Excellent. Sean Grzeski with the Alliance for Sustainability. We have an incorporated neighborhood where we have the Midtown Farmers Market right at the Hiawatha Lake Light Rail, and I can walk to basically any possible thing I want. And, uh, and then I'm going to have to head over to the Capitol at 10 a.m. They have a bunch of bad transportation bills over there uh, with defund or whatever limit funding. So I have to head out at 10. But 
Um, if, if any of the cities are interested, um, one of the new projects of the Alliance is to help partner with cities and counties to look at the, the county and MnDOT road improvement schedule and how that can be you know, teamed up with your like pad like crossings and green infrastructure improvements. And it's kind of tying into helping cities that are trying to implement their new Compline Energy Resilience Goals. So I'll just hand around a thing. If anybody wants to get in touch, you can give me a call. Okay, thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Smoke. Um, I work for the Department of Health and um, my spouse and I moved to Minnesota just about a year, just over a year ago, and so we were looking to buy a house and walkability was really important. We um, ended up buying a house in a long neighborhood and my restrictions for our realtor were a 10-minute walk to a grocery store, uh -huh. be able to ride my bike to downtown St. Paul in under an hour, and um, be able to get to light rail really easily. So, yeah, very important. Yeah, it seems like I saw you during the winter biking uh, <laughs> like down, time. downtown. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, I'm Kristen Rowe. I'm with the Environmental Quality Board. I live in San Anthony Village. Um, I'm a little too far from the grocery store, but the municipal liquor store is definitely in the water. <laughs> 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 All right, excellent. Peter. Good morning. Peter Lindstrom, Clean Energy Resource Teams, also the mayor of the city of South Park. And I bike to work on the St. Paul campus of the UM, where they have the dairy lab and the meat lab. You can get milk. And uh, cheese and ice cream that originated in the cows from the University of Minnesota. As so local as you can get. Yeah. And I can walk to Super America. That's my place. That's exciting. Okay. Good morning. I'm Jeremy Gumke from St. Anthony, um, Public Works Department specifically. Uh, I live in Richfield, um, so we're kind of a suburban design. Uh, walkability. It's possible, but you gotta want it. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta want to do it. Mm-hmm. Gotta put that extra effort. Yeah. You know, sidewalks only on bus routes. Yeah. The quality of the walking, biking transit environment, key. We'll learn a lot about that today. Uh, let's see. Back to Max. Uh, I'm Max Musicamp. I'm the founder of Central Musicamp for uh, activation and bike making firm. Uh, I love to grocery shop. Five to ten weeks. I live a block. Uh, so I can do that. Okay. My name is Faye Simer. I work for the City Hall Public Works and Community Safety Advocate. I live in Minneapolis. I do live kind of walking around the neighborhood all by city light or um, I think the beer is closer. <laughs> Um, and I finished great plans to do also live in South Minneapolis and uh, within a couple of blocks I can be here and here. Great. Thank you all. I don't know, is there any comments from the web webinar people? Not that I'm seeing. Okay, but I think webinar people to... we do have the chat function, so if they okay, so people on webinar, if you wanna add in a comment, um, response, feel free to. Um, so in thinking about this topic, I thought back to 1993. I just started uh, working for a small um, office of environmental assistance uh, based um, at the state of Minnesota. And we were fortunate. We had sort of more grant funding. So we had funded a project with the city of Minneapolis, which was at that point just working on a sustain its first sustainability plan, Minneapolis in Maybe 89 with the city of St. Paul had done a carbon baseline um, uh, greenhouse gas assessment. By 93, I remember very clearly a 153 page sustainability plan, the first that Minneapolis um, had done. And we had funded a project to take that or look at that, that huge plan, conduct some neighborhood um, meetings, uh, working with Ken Meter. Um, was a, sort of really a neighborhood-based um, process, uh, sort of an economic analysis person. And, and well, because we had this huge plan, but it's like how to make this plan more relevant to neighborhood groups, to other stakeholders in the city, we ended up uh, distilling a set of sustainability indicators. So the 
153 page report was extremely, still extremely useful for staff, but we distilled down to, and it's now uh, City of Minneapolis, that's maybe, well, it was 28 or 29 indicators, broad range of economic quality of life, um, uh, environmental indicators. And in, in sort of putting the finishing touches on this, this set of indicators, the city of Minneapolis said, we're going we're to call this, you know, this sort of effort is going to be called something. And what do we call it? So it was pretty, it pretty quickly became clear that it was going to be called the walkable city. So, so this is 1993 and sort of Minneapolis, obviously, you know, like Red Wing, an old city, uh, uh, old uh, streetcar um, uh, uh, neighborhoods and down, a large downtown, but the walkable city, that was sort of the, um, um, that, that was what resonated with people, uh, staff from multiple departments that we were working with, the neighborhood groups. Um, and so it, it, this topic sort of makes me realize that cities, you know, cities do have this ability and control over the essential sort of land use uh, dimensions of the city. So streets, so I tried to sort of put sort of the, all these interacting elements, sort of really the streets, street design, buildings, building fronts, uh, site design, sort of how do these work and what are the elements of these? What can a city um, uh, uh, do to help shape an environment that frankly makes walking pleasant, well, just uh, uh, doable? So being able to take transit, you need a certain density of people, um, but riding uh, transit is you're always a walker there. If you're a bicyclist, you're you obviously are a pedestrian also. So this sort of viability and desirability, uh, these, these things that cities control, um, really sort of evolve into sort of what, um, how viable is it to uh, do something other than, than use a car. And then the benefits um, obviously are, are here. The, um, uh, the Met Council every year for a number of years, probably over 20 years, has had money available uh, in their livable communities program. That, um, the grant round is open again. Um, and here I just plucked off their um, uh, web solicitation page. Uh, so this is sort of language that, um, uh, that they have used. I also I forgot I don't have a slide on this, but um, uh, but Green Step uh, says we work closely with a, um, a, a organization, reti the Retiree Environmental Technical Assistance Program. So we have funding for um, experts in mostly energy uh, and water sort of waste assessment fields. But we've uh, just brought on Barb Bowman, who was the former founder, executive director of Transit for Local Communities. And so Barb is um, uh, is working with several cities around uh, the state, uh, and she has around 40 hours per city. So if your city is interested in bringing on someone to work specifically on road diets, so traffic calming, taking four lane roads, putting them into two lane roads with a uh, central turn lane, or parking policies, pricing, uh, so parking min minimums, maximums. So this is one of those interrelated sustainability issues when we talk about uh, walkability, we're talking about roads. And so uh, Barb is available to Green Step Cities for consulting, it's free to you. Um, uh, so uh, just contact um, me through the website if you're interested. And she's sort of stacking up a, a number of projects. And she has, from her previous work with Transit for Liberal Communities, has good contact with the uh, FHWA, so there's some funding. MnDOT has been prior, looking around the state, prioritizing some of their roads or state aid roads. They'd like to see um, roads that are under about 20, yeah, always under 20,000 average daily vehicles, uh, shrinking those down. Uh, so let's see, with, with that, so we have, um, uh, we have scheduled four speakers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Peter uh, Bruce, who does retail pedestrian uh, studies, is not able to be here today. Um, he had a client unexpectedly, um, coming into town, he just really had to be there. So he's very, uh, he's sorry, couldn't join us, but I do have a handout from Peter, a little example of um, some work he did. And then on the back page, yeah, a list of the sort of, give you a sense of the sort of work that, that Peter does. So he's working for, he's doing retail pedestrian counts. So think about your classic, you know, traffic count that a city will do either during like development review for a, a project or, um, uh, traffic counts, if you're concerned about like too much traffic in an area, well, flip it the other way. Peter is helping cities and especially local chambers and businesses think about, well, we want traffic. I mean, ultimately you need 
person walking into uh, retail businesses, uh, retail business. And so he's uh, been doing this work since the early 90s. Um, so um, pick up a handout from him. And he is, if anyone is interested in joining him on just uh, one of his sort of uh, pedestrian counts, one of his projects uh, in Duluth, St. Cloud, Minneapolis. So this summer he'll be doing uh, a number of walks. So uh, feel free to give him a call and say, hey, I was at the Green Step workshop and you know, could I tag along for a couple hours on one year pedestrian walk? So, so he's offering that. Um, our other three speakers, I'll just say a, a few words about you all and then you can say a little more about yourself, you know, more about you than I do. But it's very exciting to have uh, three people uh, who I've known for long and short times. Uh, so Emily, uh, Emily Smoke from um, Department of Health uh, contacted Green Step very shortly after arriving here. So we're really thrilled to have come from the West Coast with her uh, talent. Um, uh, and so she is uh, working or sort of ha has and is in charge of the, uh, the first uh, pedestrian, state pedestrian plan. So the pedestrian plan is, is one of uh, MnDOT sort of in the family of plans. So you've got the aviation aeronautics plan, you've got the trunk highway plan, um, you've got the bus plan, so uh, bicycle, state bicycle plan, so first ever pedestrian plan. So she'll sort of talk about uh, sort of resources for cities and um, related work that state health improvement plan funded county people do with cities. Um, Max Musican, I would describe as really sort of the region's sort of preeminent uh, placemaker. Um, so Max is out there um, sort of uh, helping sort of shape the pedestrian environment so that um, public and private spaces are just to have that sort of that vitality, that uh, sort of want to be there uh, benefits multiple benefits. Uh, and then uh, uh, Faye, uh, most relevant to us as uh, city people, uh, Faye Simmer um, is the first and we're thinking the only full-time city in Minnesota, city uh, pedestrian coordinator. Um, so who she works with, uh, I know she's, um, I was recently with uh, the St. Paul Sustainability Working Group department uh, uh, staff and heads and she was there and it would be just fascinating to hear uh, the privatization that the city of St. Paul uh, made in this area. Um, so. With that, we'll begin with um, Emily. I think we have about, probably about 25 minutes, so I'll sort of wave if you, if you want. But I know each of our speakers have a lot of great information. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, quicker. Okay. Um, thank you guys for having me. Uh, my name is Emily Smoke. I work for the Minnesota Department of Health. I'm a transportation planner, which makes a lot of people question what they just heard. Um, it's a very unique position. Uh, like Philip said, I'm fairly new to Minnesota. We moved here about a year and a quarter ago. Um, I had spent most of my adult life on, um, in Seattle, so on the West Coast-ish. Uh, but this was a, an opportunity that I couldn't turn down. I had been working for a long time in transportation demand management and um, different active transportation planning roles, but being able to work for a health department and work on transportation planning is this is the only state that has that opportunity available and it's something you should really be proud of um, as Minnesota. So I, one of the big, one of the big programs statewide that I work on implementing is the Statewide Health Improvement Partnership. Are any of you familiar with that? One, two. Okay, well it's something that you should be really familiar with and hopefully I can provide some insight as to what it, what it is. Um, so uh, in, in Minnesota, there's a really solid understanding at the Department of Health that medical care is critically important. Medicine is, has done wonders to the world that we live in, but um, there are lots of opportunities to create built environments and social structures that make it so that we can uh, avoid medical care and work on preventative care um, and save millions and millions of dollars a year by doing so. Um, so one of the ways in which we do that is through our statewide health improvement partnership or SHIP for short. Um, SHIP is our state uh, preventative health care program. We work on a handful of strategies, so tobacco cessation, um, health improvement around breastfeeding and childcare, uh, creating healthy schools, um, 
and really just the policy systems and built environment changes that we can address. And so my part of the SHIP program is working on uh, transportation and uh, physical activity. So I work on walking, bicycling, and transit. And so uh, what we have determined is that these, that transportation is a public health issue and that's really important to us. And so one of the ways in which we are uh, kind of putting our, we're walking the talk, I guess, um, is through the statewide pedestrian plan. And so uh, in 2015, I believe, I, I was not here, thank you for giving me credit, but I did not do the pedestrian plan. I'm, I'm uh, working on implementation of it. So in 2015, uh, the Department of Transportation decided that we, we really need to have a statewide pedestrian plan. We've never had one before. We have, yeah, we have our aeronautics plan, we have our transit plan, we have our highways plan, but we need to have a plan that addresses uh, people walking in, in our state. Um, so there's only a handful of states nationwide that have statewide pedestrian plans, so it's very unique that we have one. But what's even more unique is that uh, Minnesota is the only state in the nation that has a dual agency plan. And so our pedestrian plan was uh, done by the Department of Transportation and the Department of Health. So throughout the entire plan, you will see aspects of public health integrated into the transportation system for pedestrian access. Um, throughout the plan, oops, sorry. Um, in order to develop the plan, there was a, a huge uh, community engagement process. I would argue that it was a larger community engagement process because of public health's involvement. Planners are good at, at, at public engagement, but public health, I think, is a little bit better. Um, and so it was done statewide. Uh, it was about a six-month process, and there was just a huge road show. There was a group of uh, 25 stakeholders um, and people, or I guess partners, who were a part of this team, um, and then the Department of Transportation and Department of Health uh, leading it up. And so they traveled around the state. They did tons of community gatherings and pop-up events at libraries and um, events that were focused at different age groups, so hanging out at senior centers for conversations and having uh, talks with groups of teenagers and children. Uh, and what they found out was that uh, it's, there are some very clear populations in which it's much harder for them to have access to safe, desirable walking facilities. Um, these groups are uh, American Indians, our youth, our aging population, people with disabilities, uh, people who are low income, living in urban areas, and I think I'm forgetting one of them. Um, I'm forgetting one, but I'm not going to look it up right now. I'll find it in a minute. Uh, but these groups also told us that they, they provided us some additional insight as to maybe why it's harder for them to walk and where they really want to walk to. So I really appreciated Philip's uh, introduction, asking everyone uh, whether or not they feel like they live in a walkable neighborhood and whether or not they can walk to get food. Because the number one thing we heard throughout this community engagement process is people want to walk to food. They want to walk to the grocery store more than anywhere else. And arguably the liquor store, we always see like in winter, the goat paths through the snow that are like, a beeline to the liquor store and that's <laughs> people want to eat there we got to make it safe for them to get there um other places that people said it was important for them to walk to were uh school so everything from preschool to higher education jobs and then parks and green space uh and those stood out above all above all else but some of the reasons why people weren't walking were Lack of destination, so they um, live in a community in which their their school was sited 20 miles out of town on really cheap land on top of a landfill or whatever the situation was. Um, or there isn't a grocery store within three miles of their house, and so it's not even feasible for them to really bicycle to the grocery store. Uh, winter maintenance was a huge, huge barrier for people, so um, lack of snow removal or for management of ice. Um, I'm sure we've all walked on days where it, it snows and then it melts and then at night it freezes and then you have an ice skating rink outside of your home. Uh, poor sidewalks or lack of sidewalks. 
And then the final one was driver behavior. So people speeding or people being aggressive in their cars. So how does this impact health? I, I talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but um, being physically active is one of the most important things we can do to stay healthy. I don't come from a public health background, so I can't give you the whole spiel on all of that. I'm slowly learning. Um, but what I do know is that only about half of American adults are getting the amount of physical activity they need on a day-to-day -day basis. And only about, and, and I think just under half of our youth are, which is really, really concerning, especially when you look at the increasingly, uh, the raising rates of obesity in our country and here in Minnesota. Um, and so walking is something that everyone does. It might look different for some people. Some people uh, walk using a wheelchair. Some people drive to the grocery store and then walk to the front door and other people drive to work and walk down the parking ramp and over the, across the street into their office. And then some people rely on walking truly to get around to everything they need. So um, walking is one of the best ways that we can address physical activity in, in our society. Um, and uh, how does that impact health equity? So in moving a little bit past uh, the health aspects of walking, when we, think of, when we think about healthy societies, we think a lot about the social determinants of health. So uh, things like having high quality schools, having safe neighborhoods, um, having a stable economy, other things that contribute to the health of a community. Um, one of the, uh, there was a, I believe, Harvard study in 2015 that uh, said that having reliable transportation options beyond a personal vehicle is the, is the number one factor in the odds of escaping poverty, which is pretty eye-opening um, in itself. And then if you add that on top of the fact that AAA does um, cost reports of how much, how much we're spending in Minnesota every year on owning and operating vehicles, if you own and operate uh, a, a, like a mid-priced range uh, sedan, so like a Honda Accord or a Toyota Camry, you are spending on average in Minnesota um, just under $10,000 a year on using that car. If you are making a minimum wage, federal minimum wage in Minnesota, you're making about $20,000 a year. And so if we're thinking about health and health equity and social determinants of health, Addressing transportation is, we're getting the most bang for our buck. It's probably one of the most important, arguably one of the most important things that we can work on. It's a way for people to increase their physical activity. It's a way to get them access to things like food and to higher education and to childcare, um, to jobs. And it's also a way to help um, reduce household costs in one area so that maybe they can be spent on more other important things like rent or a nice pair of clothes to her to a job interview. So um, some things I wanted to talk about with Minnesota Walks are the ways in which we're implementing it. Uh, one of the first things uh, is that we have some, we just recently were granted some unique funding through the Centers for Disease Control um, and Prevention on doing some disability-focused pedestrian planning work. And so we have this grant that uh, was given to 17 states. We were one of them. We're the, we're the only one who is working on any sort of transportation uh, project with this funding, but it's, it's funding to improve the health of people with uh, mobility disabilities and cognitive disabilities. And so what we're doing is a pilot program uh, in a couple of communities statewide uh, that's focused on doing pedest pedestrian plans that are um, intentionally inclusive of the disability community. And so it's kind of taking an ADA transition plan approach um, and a really heavy community engagement approach. One of the communities in which we're piloting this in currently is Mapleton in Blue Earth County. And so we've been working um, with Region 9 Development Commission and Blue Earth County Public Health on, on doing this work. and. As we start to develop best practices, those will all be released statewide, and the hope is that 
um, throughout our implementation of Minnesota Walks, we can integrate a lot of that, um, a lot of that learning into how our um, district statewide are implementing pedestrian plans and improvements. And another way in which we're implementing uh, Minnesota Walks is through our technical assistance coming out of the Department of Health. And so, like I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest barriers to walking is that uh, year-round upkeep of our pedestrian network, so our sidewalks and our multi-use paths. So people talked a lot about snow and ice removal. But when we went out and we talked to practitioners, um, that was also one of their biggest barriers was we don't know what to do. This is this. If if we do one thing, it's affecting our our groundwater. If we do something else, it's cost prohibitive. And so, what we've been working on the last couple of months uh, with a local consulting firm, Tools Design Group, is coming up with some best practices of snow and ice removal statewide, um, and also in communities regionally that are experiencing comparable winters. Um, and so I have copies of that for some of you guys. Um, actually, I think I only have one copy of it, but you're welcome to pass it around. It's posted online, so it just came out last week. It's very new guidance. Um, okay, what do you search for now? And it will be posted on the Department of Health. The Department of Health has a website for the Statewide Health Improvement Partnership, SHIP, and there's a pedestrian page on that website um, that has these guides available for download and I'm happy to send out the exact link afterwards if that would be helpful. Yeah, um, that link on the resources page from this webinar. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And then um, it will also be in the future on um, the Minnesota Walks webpage which is administered through the Department of Transportation. And on Green Subsidies. Oh, surely. Yeah. 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 You can add it on there, too. And relevant to this one is the bill they're working on across the street, the stop over salting bill to reduce the liability of businesses that document their yeah. post salt maintenance. Yes. And so the website is just stopoversalting.org. Um, I think they, they have Republican sponsors. They have a feeling it could get through this year. Yeah. I am uh, married to a stormwater engineer, like a side person will know, and so we have a lot of family conversations around best practices around winter maintenance. Because he's <laughs> very concerned about over salting, and I'm very concerned about access, and it's just a, a very, it's very interesting. Welcome to my life. The other uh, area that we heard of from community members about what prevents them from wanting to walk or making the easy choice to walk uh, was lack of sidewalks or sidewalks that are crumbling in really poor condition. And so we put out some other guidance. Actually, I have three copies of this one. Clearly, I didn't do a good job. Um, but it's a sidewalk repair funding guide. Um, so it's, again, compiling best practices from throughout the state and comparable communities region-wide on um, creative funding and sustainable funding mechanisms for sidewalks. Uh, another piece of guidance, I'll pass around. These are drafts of the, or not drafts, I guess this is the final product, they just say draft, of the Minnesota Walks um, pedestrian plan if you guys want to look through this all. Um, some other implementation that we've been working on is I just, uh, Ended a three week statewide um, roadshow training with communities. Uh, we have uh, local public health in all 87 counties that are working on active transportation. And so once a year we go out and my team and I, we do regional trainings. And so our training this year, we're focused on uh, experiential learning. And so what we did was we took people on walk audits and um, the walk audits revolved around access to food. And so we use these guides, if any of you have seen them before, they're really handy. They're, they were developed through the Department of Health. I have a ton of them with me today, but they're essentially um, how to facilitate a walk audit and they make it really, really easy to gather feedback. So a walk audit is when you go out on a walk and um, you take some time to really think about how you feel while walking in certain areas. Um, 
this guide provides um, really good prompts on what to think about. So um, I thinking about maybe if you were using a wheelchair or if you had a small child with you and thinking about how drivers are behaving and um, which way the curb cuts are facing when you cross an intersection. And then it also provides space to write down your thoughts. Um, so we've found them to be really, really useful in our regional trainings and I would be happy to give you guys copies if you want to take them back to your communities. But it was really interesting on a lot of these walks, the, the, the variety of food retail locations that we were able to walk to from a lot of our training um, locations was just, I don't know, all across the board. There were some places where the only, the only food you could walk to within a couple miles was a gas station. Um, and when you get into the gas station and observe the healthy food options, it's pretty dismal. It, it can be, um, whereas, whereas other communities had um, phenomenal grocery stores that were within really easy walking distance of some residential neighborhoods. And these are in communities that uh, we, we mainly focus on small communities, so under 5,000 people. Uh, and then Can you explain how it ties in with the kind of the bikeable audits that I think are available for bike men, where they do the like kind of a walking audit, but also focused on bikes? Yeah. Um, well, let me talk about these really quick because it'll probably it'll tie into that. Um, so, some of you might be familiar with the Bikeable Community Workshops. They those are administered through the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota, um, the Department of Transportation, and the Department of Health, and it's a statewide training opportunity that communities can apply for. Uh, we'll we'll go there and we'll host a day long training um, with you know two dozen community members, engineers, public works folks, uh, elected officials, et cetera. And we'll run them through kind of the six E's of creating bikeable communities. We'll take them on a bike ride and do a similar style of audit. Um, but we've been running these for a couple of years now and they've been really in incredible opportunities to create some clear action planning steps for communities who maybe don't know where to start. And so what we're doing this year is reviving an old workshop that we ran years ago and hadn't been running for a long time, uh, the walkable community workshops. And so it's, it will be similar to the bikeable community workshops, um, a little bit less intense. I think it'll only be MnDOT and the Department of Health, or it will be. And it'll be like a three, three quarters of a day training, not a full day. But um, applications just went live last week. Um, communities are, Statewide are encouraged to apply. We'll be picking uh, five to six, depending on locations, and uh, notifying communities this summer, and then hosting the um, workshops in the fall. And I think that's what I have. Are there any questions? I'm happy to answer some now or later. What's your uh, biggest um, take from Seattle versus Minneapolis as far as, uh, I mean, what, what's your, that both are like bikeable, most bikeable cities, but what was your biggest um, insight? Personally, I think Minneapolis is far ahead of Seattle in bicycling infrastructure. Like it is, in my opinion, much more comfortable to bike here and there's a way better network. Uh, whereas walking was a lot easier in Seattle and it's not necessarily because of infrastructure, not because of pedestrian infrastructure, it's because of density. So. That's, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I was at the APA conference last week and went to a session on Park City. Yeah. And they were they were talking about the pedestrian experience and you know what you see and what you feel and how that's changing because now we're walking like this uh -huh. and we're not really experiencing that. So I'm wondering how are you factoring in or how maybe plus of an issue in the Yeah. I don't think I've ever thought about smartphones as being a distraction from the built in how it, how it feels to walk. I've only ever really thought about smartphones and safety and being aware of surroundings. Um, but that's really interesting. Yeah, so what if they're not your six walkers? And something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I am handing people pamphlets, so we like, should be thinking about that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the, the walk audits that we do are in, incredible. I cannot 
they seem really simple and like they look really like I don't know fun and like almost like a little kid's document, but they are incredibly powerful tools, especially if you have the opportunity to take an engineer who designed a roadway out on a walk on the roadway he, does, he or she designed. It is, it is unbelievable the responses you will get. Like, okay, thank you. You know, you, you did this roadway design five years ago, what, seven years ago. What's, would you, would you want to walk with your kid across the street to go get ice cream at the Dairy Queen or whatever? And some, some of the responses are just eye-opening. So I encourage you to take them. I brought a lot with me. Um, we've got a lot of their office. So, yes? I had a question um, related to Stillwater. Is um, some of the volunteers I know that are part of Sustainable Stillwater have been keeping an eye on the new downtown plan for Stillwater mm -hmm. as part of the comprehensive plan. Um, but they're worried that the Chamber of Commerce and their tourism department and their, their consultant SRF weren't really aware of everything it would really take for dealing with the volume of potential uh, guests coming to Stillwater for bike tourism and all the walkability and mm -hmm. there's still a lot, it's fairly dicey, you know, on roads in Washington County but, uh, and also just looking at bike parking and or crossing. And then there's a MnDOT road that will be re redone, Highway 95 through downtown Stillwater. Mm -hmm. So if they if they wanted to try to beef up the, you know, having better plans for um, crosswalks or bike parking or wayfinding to get from these trails to mm -hmm. the into town, is there any any other consultants that could help them to? Uh, figure out the gaps in their downtown comp plan and or do additional walking audits to like make sure that they're not they're not kind of baking in a comp plan that is not really going to do the job for what they need for mm -hmm. the past. That's, um, that's a really good question and it um, reminds me to talk a little bit about um, the state health improvement partnership again so we have like I mentioned earlier, people working on active living in all 87 counties. These are public health employees who have been trained in how to host walk audits, how to identify gaps in wayfinding, um, and then even some of them, not all of them, but some of them have training in how to um, do policy review in comprehensive plan updates or local plan updates, um, and kind of take do their review with the eye of health in all policies and looking at the transportation sections with health in all policies. So I would start by maybe having a conversation with your local shift coordinator um, for, you said it was Washington County? Oh uh, yeah. 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 yeah, so that would be um, one, one area in which you could go. And then there are also consulting firms um, in the state of Minnesota that focus specifically on biking and walking and stuff. Other We're going to call Steve Park, who lives nearby and just retired from being the guy managing that for the League of American Bike Bicyclists. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just wondering about what's actually sidewalk um, snow clearing guide. I don't know if it's somewhere out there. Uh, we didn't provide like a best recommendation. This is what all the community should be doing, but we provided a couple of examples on um, ways in which communities can manage snow and ice clearing best practices and kind of laid out the options. And so we talked a lot about how some communities in Minnesota are taking it upon themselves to clear the entire sidewalk network. Um, oftentimes these are smaller communities that have a lot less miles of sidewalk than, for instance, Minneapolis or St. Paul. Um, but, but, it, but it happens. Like I was in Grand Rapids, Minnesota just two weeks ago and their public works department clears every foot of sidewalk in the entire community. Um, then there are other com communities in which it's kind of a shared approach. It's property owners and the public works department or the parks department, who, the government agency. Um, and what they'll do is they'll identify prior, a priority snow clearing network. And so this is based on a lot of different things, but oftentimes they're looking at 
um, demographics maps and then looking at where schools are and where grocery stores are and where high density of workplaces are. And they'll be clearing and, and where transit is. And then they'll take it upon themselves, the government agency, to clear those priority networks first. And then the property owners fill in the gaps. And then there are other models um, like Minneapolis, if any of you live there, where property owners are fully responsible for clearing their sidewalks. Um, and then under each of those categories, there's examples of how different communities actually administer those programs. So for instance, um, in Madison, Wisconsin, you are required by law to have your, your sidewalk cleared by noon um, after the snow, by noon the, the, the following day after the snow event. And if you don't, there's no warning system, you get a 130-ish dollar fine as a first time offender and $170 fine every time you are uh, caught not clearing your snow after that. And so it's like a really, a really intense policy. Minneapolis, and they have, they have inspectors who go out and look. Minneapolis, I have only lived one winter here, but I feel like it's a little bit more lax, but still property owners are fully responsible. So we kind of just lay out the different options, but there is um, one uh, best practice from Finland um, where they do snow compressing and um, a lot of people do prefer that but then we run into problems around melt and refreeze which can be dangerous too so it's it's hard it's really it is really hard to say what is the best practice um, and a lot of people have differing opinions yeah the number one challenge oh I, I, I believe it I have rolled ice rinks yeah whatever when I was like working on this project, I was like, this is going to be great. We're going to have all these best practices. And now I feel like I've opened a can of worms and everyone's like, what should we do? And it's like, raise a guide and we can talk. <laughs> and then some of the fingers are awesome too, because they, they, the water can soak down and you don't have isolation. So if you, if you have buildings that have some of the papers near the entrances, mm -hmm. it's super good for reducing isolation. Yeah. With that snowpack method, is that less accessible for people in wheelchairs? Is that an issue that you've run into? I mean, I don't. I don't know. I think if it was done really well, me, I really don't know the answer Hard to that. Hard to calibrate. It's just the right amount. Yeah. Freeze. Saw freeze. Uh, yeah. Good traction. Uh, yeah. It's tough. Man. There's also um, a best practice around there. There are communities in North America, in Northern North America that have um, heated sidewalks that melt the snow, like Holland, Michigan, the entire downtown core is heated sidewalks. Um, there are a couple places in Minnesota that have like patches of heated sidewalks outside of major retail areas. Um, and then there are cities in Canada that are working on entire pedestrian networks that are heated. Got issues too. Was there a question over here? Okay, well, thank All you, right. Emily. Yeah, thank you. All right, so next up is uh, Max Music here. And Emily, it looks like you have a bunch of the. Um... Yes. Okay. A bunch of these. Yeah, yeah. anyone who wants to put it back there. Um, yeah. All right. We're going to now take sort of that high level perspective and uh, focus for the next 25 minutes on how do we create places where people want to be. Uh, where people want to be, they'll want to walk around. Uh, and really thinking about that user experience as a tool to drive walkability. Um, talking about the strategy as well as uh, exploring some real life place making successes uh, at a number of different types of locations and communities across the metro. Um, we'll get to six, our 6.5 6 steps to activate your community, your commercial district, the well being of your residents, and the social and commercial value of your community. But first, oops, uh, I want people to move their chairs so that they feel that they have privacy from the people around them. You're kind of already set up. But that's not going to be great. You did awesome. Second, well, I want you to move your chair. You can meet exactly one other person and say hi to that person to introduce yourself. Hi. Hey. Hi. 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 Hi.
Okay. Now move your chair so you can have a conversation with a group of three to four people. Wheels make it easy. Yeah, it's good. You guys are doing great. And then move your chair one more. This is really tempting. Uh, move your chair one more time so you can best listen to this presentation. <laughs> you guys did really good. Uh, so why why do we do that? Um, and I think, gosh, this thing is like. Uh, movable chairs are really a metaphor uh, for place making and creating places that people want to be and that are walkable. And so. I gave you those those four desires and things that you want to be able to do. And in every step, you adapted your environment to do the things that, that you wanted to feel more comfortable. Every time that prompt changed, all of a sudden your alignment wasn't so optimal anymore. And you adjusted to make sure that it felt better and was more conducive to the things you wanted to do. Um, and that's really what placemaking and creating walkability is all about. Now, it'd be almost in, it would be pretty insane if the chairs or the swivel couldn't move and they were really fixed in place, and so you couldn't move them. Really only able to do one of those things. That would be much more like a bench. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of our environment is very bench-like, rather than like movable chairs. Now, benches are good at doing some things, but they are usually only good at doing one thing. They, they're fixed in place. They tell you where to look. If you want to be in the shade and it's in the sun, or vice versa, tough luck. They're not very social, and it's hard to sort of pivot over and so our environment a lot most of it i say functions more like a bench both in its design but then also in the rules and regulations policies social norms that we use to manage and care for the spaces so if we want to create more walkable communities more vibrant uh, social and economic communities we need to transition from a bench world into a world of movable chairs by using placemaking so why does this matter um we work with um, large office buildings, suburban shopping centers, urban, suburban, and small town communities, transit agencies of all kinds. And we see uh, three major trends which are really um, affecting uh, community and commercial environments and making place much more important. One is that mobile technology is freeing people up to do whatever they want, when they want, and where they want. We obviously still show up in person to do things, but the mobile phones and mobile technology has basically allowed the user to, to have a lot more power about when and where they spend their time. When they have the time, they're choosing to do experiences over things. There's a large scale trend of people spending more money on doing stuff rather than having stuff. And the things that they want to do, the experiences they want to have are social. And the people are going out of their way and paying money to be in environments that, that allow them to socialize with others or just be alone together around other people. There are many business models that are popping up that are uh, leveraging this trend. Starbucks is one of the first and largest and most successful to use those. They create a comfortable environment to be around people first, and then they monetize that by selling coffee while they're there. Um, you can see the rise in co-working spaces. Uh, this is an interesting one where more uh, like gyms are now introducing co-working spaces into those facilities, working facilities are introducing more uh, social and wellness activities, everything to leverage social uh, in all the things that are occurring. So how can communities adapt to these emerging demands and trends? If people no longer have to be anywhere, the key dominant strategy for commercial and communities needs to be to create places where people actually want to be and seek out. And then wherever people want to be, they're gonna want to do things nearby live, work, eat, play, shop, walk, bike, uh, et cetera, really do anything. And so and then the people want to be in the places that deliver these experiences. And so the underlying strategy of place is that if a, if a location is delivering positive and useful experiences, people will use it more. The more people use a space, they start to develop positive habits and routines in that space. And then those routines are the foundation that support relationships between people uh, relationships between people and physical place. I think we can all think of physical places that we have an emotional attachment to. Um, and then also it provides the certainty that enterprise needs to invest in businesses because they know there's a regularity of habits and usage in a space. 
And then ultimately that creates value, both social value, social capital, and relationships between, between people, but then also commercial value. And if we think about the real estate adage of location, 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 what does that really mean? That is that there's a physical place that is delivering such uh, positive uh, experiences and uses on a regular basis that it is worth investing more in that location to intensify the level of use that's able to occur. So through placemaking and through delivering positive and useful experiences on a regular basis, we can create locational real estate value as well as the social capital that is so important for just our living life. And so the public realm is the best venue to deliver this experiential value to residences, businesses, and visitors. And this public realm is both what we as communities own and this publicly owned land, but also all the privately owned shared spaces that also dominate our community. These are two examples of such, um, one in the Corcoran neighborhood, where the gentleman who left uh, lives, where the farmer's market is, and this is uh, at Central Station in downtown St. Paul, two sites that we've worked on doing events there. And so how do you then actually make a place? Um, and over the last six years of doing this work for, I don't even know how many, 60, 70, 80, placemaking project, we've developed a real process about how do you generate these experiences and the activity uh, to generate value in a place. And so one of the most powerful metaphors that we use is to follow the desire line. And it's all about figuring out what do you and others want to be able to do in the space, what are people already trying to do, and then following those desires and enhancing an environment through a number of ways to, to um, uh, just celebrate and enhance the experience of, of that desire. And so if we look at this photo in a bench mentality, we would say some, we designed this park and these pathways to go parallel and the connecting pathway is 100 feet down and my God, people are killing the grass by walking from point A to point B. And what we should do is we should put up some fences, we should resod that grass and, may, and return it to the integrity of the, ori of the, of the original uh, uh, conception of this design. And I see it happen again and again. I walk through Loring Park all the time. There's one particular spot which just happens like every other year. And the fence, the ugly orange fences go up. The, the grass goes back. The fences come down. People walk on the path again. And the grass dies and the cycle repeats. And so we can do that. It's just not very fun or effective. Uh, but if we were looking at this in a movable chair view, we would see that we are getting very powerful um, user feedback here and that people are literally voting with their feet and telling us that they want to go from here to there at this exact location and you know what no one foresaw that and that's okay because nobody no matter what anyone tells you can predict the future and so we are responding to what is actually happening and that's great and so it's like why god my god look at this information that we're getting let's celebrate this let's pave that path and maybe even want to put an archway over there Maybe we want to put some seating next to it, some activities to make that pathway even more interesting and valuable. And so it's taking this, this sort of information as it shows up in a variety of different ways and continually enhancing the environment to, a, to, to make it better for the, the users who are in that space. The second piece is we have found, after doing this, the same six things are always needed in a, in a space. And it's, the, it's questions that we ask and things that need to be working together. And they work together in different ways. But, it's the real, but a successful and valuable place is such because of the relationship between its physical environment, <coughs> the management of that physical environment, which Emily talked a lot about too, and then the activities and the uses and events which then happen within that. And so often these three things are happening, but they don't relate to each other. They're done in silos and they don't connect. And so it's the relationship and how they all work together that unlocks the value of a place. And the way to figure out what that relationship needs to be is to do a continuous cycle of user engagement, communication, and then uh, data collection and assessment about what's going on. And then it's holistic and that we're thinking about all these six things together and it's con a continuous process. Yes, there's going to be peaks of activity when large capital projects happen, but a project is never done. Places just like people can and should get better over time. And to run this cycle will ensure that like, we're in a dynamic learning environment that is always adapting to the wants and needs of, of our users. 
And when we do that, we'll create places that are both meaningful, adaptable, and hyper useful to uh, commercial and community interests. And so um, from the work that we've done in other places, we've used this process to um, increase daily usage in a space by three to 500%. Have uh, tenants in office building be more interested in coming into the office every day, be more interested in staying at their current company, all things being equal because of programming and placemaking enhancements. 70% uh, of users feeling safer in a given location, uh, a neighborhood bike plan being passed after a demonstration event, a residence meeting five and a half new neighbors because of a placemaking initiative. Um, 50% of participants in other projects feeling like they're living a healthier lifestyle, increases in happiness during the workday, uh, and word of mouth about the excitement of a given location because of the placemaking enhancement. And this is just a small sampling of the impact um, that can be generated from placemaking. And so then how do you actually take this approach and process to create a real wow, walkable community? Um, we've developed these 6.5 steps that really, really activate your community in any space. And uh, we're just going to touch on them here, and I'm happy to like meet offline and talk for an hour or more about any one of these slides or more of them in general. Um, but one is that you want to follow the process over the product. There are things that work really well in other communities and even places within your own community. And we don't want to copy the, the last thing that happened in that pro in, and what looked like the, man the manifestation of what happened. We want to look at the process that led to that being a really great decision and a really great improvement. And so don't copy what everyone else is doing at the end. Copy that decision-making process underneath it. Two is that we want to focus on de delivering daily experiences and uses. Um, it's all, that's what uh, generates those powerful habits and routines. Three, as we said, we want to combine design, management, and events activities to deliver those experiences. We want to engage, four, we want to engage with the users or tenants of a space throughout and as much as possible co-create with the space. They're in any space as much as possible. Get people not only to engage and give feedback, but actually do the work um, and have everyone participate in, uh, in creating a walkable community. Five, telling the story both before something happens, while it happens, and then celebrating the success of what has happened. And then six, to continually enhance and evaluate what's happening. And finally, the 6.5 one is to get everyone involved and have fun. Um, if people are having fun, uh, then a lot, then they're going to get more people involved from it. And you can think about this as really the software for your public realm hardware. Uh, we all have the streets and parks and buildings and schools and et cetera. And just like our computers, we need an operating system to really get the most out of those buildings and that infrastructure. And so through placemaking and management and programming, uh, we can unlock the path, more of the, of the value from the, the facilities that we have. And then uh, a final sort of construct is that we need to start thinking about pathways as places. And uh, there's a lot of overlap with what Emily was saying here too, but the four elements that we found um, to drive walkability through dynamic pathways and places is one, they need to be safe, um, certainly from like crime, but a much larger issues from cars and, uh, and the physical danger and even a, a, a perceived physical threat from cars. Um, two, they need to connect destinations where people actually want to go. Um, three, they need to be uh, useful in of themselves as people are walking along a pathway are there things of value that not that in addition to just getting from their original destination to where they want to go can they do things throughout that pathway that are valuable and useful to them and four are they interesting and fun because people are willing to walk a good amount to connect a destination that they really want to go to but if they're if they don't have a real agenda as a rule of thumb, you need something in different and interesting to engage someone every like 30 feet, which is about a traditional storefront. And that can seem like, wow, that is a, that is a very short amount of distance. But if you're just meandering, you need something every couple steps to sort of like continually engage you. That's why people like walking around like the lakes and our, our wonderful trail system here is because there is something interesting that is engaging you pretty much that entire time. But if we look at a traditional sort of suburban sidewalk, it's safe, maybe it connects something, but it's probably not for quite some distance. 
there's not really any use around there. There's no other stores or other things to um, to do or while you have to go from point A to point B. And it maybe is attractive, it's well maintained, but it's not very interesting and fun. And so we can now use the placemaking process to particularly get in at these third and fourth um, dynamics to drive walkability. And so here are some examples from the field. Um, who here lives or works or is in charge of a community that has some large underutilized public or private green spaces? Yeah. Um, so this is a large office building in uh, across the street from Hennepin County Government Center. If you've ever been there, 333 South 7th Street office building. It's a very it's a class A nice. It's a, it's a commercial real estate designation. It's a nice office building, uh, and it had a big lawn in front of it, and um, it was really never used. It was used as a pathway, a place to smoke cigarettes, and, a, and uh, hosted about two to three one-time events every year for tenants. And it looked nice. It wasn't doing anything wrong. It wasn't uh, bringing the value down of the building or anything around it, but it just wasn't, since it wasn't being used, it wasn't creating much value for the tenants um, or then the owners of the building itself. So they brought us on board to figure out how do we create a place how do we like leverage this asset to create a place where people want to be, more activity, more value? And so we engage with the tenants. We ask them, what do you want to be able to do in this space? They said they want to socialize with their colleagues. They want to be able to eat lunch outside. They need to have stuff to do. And so then we developed this the ecosystem going back to that Venn diagram, physical improvements of seating and games, management of new procedures with the clean, the janitorial and security staff, and then started producing concerts or events of concerts, fitness, classes, happy hours, uh, game tournaments, et cetera, to get people down to that space and using it. And then every year we got better. The first year we did those physical improvements. Second year we added that programming. Third year we deepened our tenant engagement to really co-create those events with them based on tenant feedback that we were getting after every single year. And the results were some of the ones that the office buildings you saw on that data set. Um, usage was up two to 300%. Uh, tenants were much happier in the building. This is now at the forefront of their leasing pitch to come into that building itself. And the building was now renamed SPS Commerce Tower because the largest tenant uh, not only renewed their lease, but expanded their footprint in that building because of the amenities and the experience that's delivered by the Turf Club, which is the sort of rebranded name of that plaza. Second, going into a retail level, how many people live or work in a community that have commercial districts that could use a little bit more activity? Yeah. So we were brought in with the, by the city of Shakopee, their Chamber of Commerce, and their Main Street Association uh, to revitalize their historic downtown, which has, was still had good bones, but had had a lot of disinvestment over uh, a decade. And then MnDOT had... Um, redone the highway that really severed the Main Street from the Minnesota River, which was the reason why that Main Street was there. So um, thinking about how do we get more people downtown, how do we improve their experience when they do come downtown, and how can we leverage this regional trail, this, this very popular bike trail, um, to support downtown now that there's this very large barrier in between uh, the commercial and the recreational uh, facilities. And so what we did is a two-pronged approach, one, to have a one-time event to get people reacquainted with the downtown that would test concepts that could then be rolled out over the long term, and then take what we learned from that and create what we call an activation plan, which is some uh, easy to implement uh, uh, plan to uh, generate more activity uh, with little or no um, additional resources needed to make those things happen. And so here is the tunnel, which now links uh, Main Street to the to the trail, pretty foreboding and difficult to get down to. Um, and then there's the Main Street, where they just redid the sidewalks and some plazas. It, it physically is is safe, but it's not yet interesting or or very useful. And so through the one-time events, we created pop-up um, patio seating. Uh, we brought out programming uh, to test that out. We taped down a, a bike lane to try that out, and then also had a mural. Um, a mural painting exercise in the tunnel itself. So people, it, it brought people down to the river and it gave them an experience and an emotional connection to that space, which then makes it much more likely for them to revisit it afterwards. 
And so the results were, if I can say there, 57% uh, of attendees were more aware of the proximity between the river and the main street, which makes them more likely to, to go back and visit both of those afterwards. Um, two thirds wanted those events and elements continued after the event. The event was then repeated by the Main Street Association afterwards, so we created a one-time event that then has future momentum. Um, the cafe then added permanent outdoor seating to add more of that vitality to the street. And then the learnings and assessments were immediately uh, translated into that implementable action uh, activation plan, which they are now continuing to utilize uh, to, guide their, um, to guide their efforts uh, on, in downtown. Um, how many people have transit facilities in their community that could use a few more riders and a better quality experience of that, uh, of waiting for that bus? This was a partnership that we have with the downtown, Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District and Metro Transit to reimagine what um, transit riding experience could look like. Um, we worked with the busiest bus stop in downtown that didn't have a facility with 1,000 people a day on 6th and Nicollet uh, that serviced uh, so, um, commuter routes out to the suburbs, as well as uh, a local route that went from North Minneapolis down into Phil's Powderhorn. So a very diverse set of riders from across the metro. We asked people what they wanted, what they were not able to get from their current bus stop experience, is that they had nowhere to sit down, they, were, uh, they needed protection from the elements, uh, they wanted to know when the bus was going to show up, all three, pretty basic, and they were super bored. Uh, <laughs> And so that was our scope of work. And the act of asking people what they want and then giving it to them creates this virtuous cycle of um, them having more ownership over it, enthusiasm, excitement, and then in turn, they care for it a lot more. So we created a living room station, your home before you get home, um, which uh, gave them the shelter, gave them places to sit. We create our own bus uh, schedule that we put up using warm materials to really invite people in. And then we had lots of unique activities for a bus stop. We had a cubby that had art supplies, games, books, especially targeted at kids with a lot of families were using that space, but also for adults. And then we piloted unique programming like pumpkin carving, uh, free coffee and tea, uh, live music, uh, umbrella escorts from the bus stop to the bus when it rained. Uh, and it had a really big effect in that 86% of riders felt that it made their experience in the overall downtown better, 70% felt safer, um, and 95% um, made them want to catch the bus at that location even more. And anecdotally, we found that people were changing the location that they were waiting for the bus, going out of their way just to stay, just to catch the bus at this stop because it was just fun to be around this facility. And finally, how many of, our, how many of us live in communities that have front yards? Well. This is like the most, you know, this is the American space. You know, it's like every community, no matter how big, has front yards. Um, and how many of us live in communities that where, where residents want to connect more with each other? I think that's almost all of us. And so, um, as a as a pedestrian, this is probably the most dominant uh, type of space that we will encounter. And so much of our experience is defined by how the private property owners and the uses engage with that sidewalk and that and that public realm. And if the if that interaction is interesting and useful and social, people are going to walk on it all day. If it's sterile and boring or, or uninteresting, it's going to make people walk a lot less. And so if we can engage with residents to sort of reclaim their front yards for a variety of uses that make sense for them, we can start with, with little or no money um, out of the public coffers really start to create interesting and active residential and uh, communities that are, are reweaving the social fabric and encouraging much more walking. And so with a grant for, from the Knight Foundation, we created uh, the Friendly Front Yard Toolkit, which you can download online at friendlyfronts.com or just send me, uh, give me your card and I can send it to you. And um, through piloting it with 25 families in Rondo and Hamlin Midway neighborhoods in um, St. Paul, People that use this, oftentimes we give them $500 micro grants, but oftentimes they just use stuff that was already in their garage or basement. Um, they met five and a half new neighbors. 43% uh, saw people more frequently in their neighborhood. Uh, Three-fourths started eating outside and playing games in their front yard for the first time. 
43% reported biking and walking more, increases in safety, and 71% um, were going to be continuing uh, or wanted to stay in their neighborhoods more so after doing this initiative. We also did a similar pilot with the multifamily housing and, and saw similar results. So if you're thinking about social cohesion and retention of your rental population, uh, it's another powerful tool um, to, uh, to do that. And then we also worked with the city of Hopkins this last year to translate friendly front yards into friendly storefronts, which is a way to generate more social and economic activity um, through your businesses. And then also with the state of Wisconsin expanded that to the main street. So it's like sort of shock at the level of commercial district side. And these are all free toolkits that we can send. So with that, what are you waiting for? Let's do this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I don't know if I used all my time, but uh, we, uh, time for two Okay. Yeah, Max, I'm curious about uh, the whole concept of like getting people out instead of being isolated or segregated and staying yeah. inside. Okay. Yeah. Now, is that a, do you think that's a generational thing? Do you think that we're just going through peaks and valleys? I mean, I just want to go home and I want to be left alone, or do you think people have reached, or do you think that's because of an urban place where, in other words, you know, do you see segments of the population or do you think everybody just now just kind of wants to be out or get out or just be out? I think that humans are social animals and people are really hungry for it and we as a society, we don't have, at a societal level we're not having as many serendipitous and unplanned social interactions like we used to and so it's like sort of a, uh, we're sort of, we've like gotten rid of so much of that that it's hard for people to I mean, for someone to want it, they have to go outside, but then if no one else is doing it, they're not getting the social interaction. So it becomes this like negative cycle where like no one's doing it, so no one does it. But the reverse is also true in that if you can prime the pump and get people out, then all of a sudden it starts to feed on itself and that people are out because people are out and they just know that if they're out, then that they're going to interact with people. And so, well, I've, what, and placemaking then is the way to sort of get over that hump and that's it's not happening on its own anymore. And so we then need to invest for a one time or for a, seri a period of time to get those habits and routines to be established. And then those can sort of support themselves and lots of virtuous things start building on that. But we've, because of the design of, of our communities and, and others over for you know, last 60 or 70 years of prioritizing exclusively privacy and driving we've sort of destroyed the social fabric of our public realm. And so um, people really are hungry for it. And that's why they're paying money to go to coffee shops, co-working spaces, gyms, events, and all that stuff. Um, but people want that just in their day-to-day -day lives. And so through placemaking, we can like help them create it, and then it'll start feeding on itself from there. Uh, Emily, do you have something to add? Or? Yeah, I would just add that there's a lot of public health data coming out that shows increasing rates of loneliness, especially among um, younger people, and it's largely attributed to time spent um, in cars by, by themselves and device usage. So there is, yeah, exactly what you're saying. People want this. So kind of along the lines of that, do you see technology as kind of a friend or a foe to the place making um, realm? Because, like in in my world, for example. Um, now with technology, you can work from wherever your clients are. You could work from wherever in the world, um, which means our office community, from an employer standpoint, is really strained, right? Because we could, we're working from wherever. And I would think that a lot of employers or a lot of people who work um, remotely or have the ability to work remotely may feel that. So do you see that technology and kind of that digitalization as uh, an opportunity to to help enhance placemaking or is it a real challenge? Yeah, I think it's both. I think it's one, it's, it, the thing it's doing is, doing, as I said, is putting the users, all people are just having so much power over now where they spend their time. And so while it is having negative effects and that like people are having so much more screen time and they're not engaging with other people and that's not making them feel very good. And it's sort of uh, straining the work environment and like we're not, have you know we're not just like there's another reason why we don't have to be in a physical place the flip side of that though is that people now have choice about where they spend their time and it's forcing 
organizations, businesses, any like anywhere, any any entity that wants people to be somewhere, uh, they've got to step up, step up their game because they can't. I think for the last 50 or 60 years, we've been super lazy and we've actually created a lot of environments that don't feel very good and that people, if they had a choice, wouldn't want to spend time in. And so mobile tech is allowing people to be like, I'm opting out of this. I'm not going to be there. And so the flip side of that is that then people, it's creating all the, the very strong incentive to create better environments for people. And I think that's, that's how we sort of combat the, the sort of uh, dissipation of, the, of that other, of the social interaction that happens because of, of all the screen time. I mean, you say all the co-working spaces, coffee shop, I mean, like there's an insatiable need for coffee shops, it seems, in part just because they feel really good. People like working on them because they're nice environments that are built to attract people, whereas a standard office space was really not, the user experience for most of the last 50 years was not at the paramount. It was much more about efficiency or prestige or, you know, cost, things like that nature. Those still matter. But uh, you see lots of companies creating like co-working like environments and very social and dorm kind of campus like environments within their own private spaces to try to entice um, people to come to the office if they have the option of working flexibility and also as a recruitment and retention tool. So, yeah. Do you find that that goes overboard for people who enjoy some social time and then are introverts and need private time to research? Uh, I think you always, every good space will have a continuum of privacy and that like will allow users to sort of uh, pick what level they need. Because um, yes, we're not, not everyone wants to socialize all the time, even me as a hyper extrovert, I don't like doing that. Um, so good spaces allow that continuum. So, um, and I'll hang out after, I think I've gone over now. So okay. I'll, I'll hang out after if you want to talk more. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, for the context within a person working at the city level, yeah. um, thrilled to have you here. Glad to be here. Thank you. There's a clicker left on the counter up there. Um, I'm Faith Timer. I'm the pedestrian safety advocate at the city of St. Paul. Philip asked me to speak about what is it like to work um, on pedestrian safety and pedestrian planning from within a city government. Um, I started the role about exactly a year ago. I'm the first person to hold this position in St. Paul, and so um, Philip's question uh, in terms of what, is this, what does this role do, the, the answer is still evolving as we speak, and it's something that I'm learning and shaping as I go, and I feel very privileged to get to do that. Um, so a little bit about St. Paul and why the city and our elected officials decided to create this position. Um, we have approximately 10,000 miles of, or sorry, 1,000 miles of sidewalk in the city of St. Paul. Uh, at our current funding levels, we replace about six to eight miles annually. So that puts us on a 200-year replacement cycle, um, which I have a feeling is not uh, unlike a lot of other communities listening to this webinar. Um, we have about 400 miles of gap in our system, which I define as, um, you know, a road that doesn't have a sidewalk along it. Um, about 50 of those miles are served by recreational trails. And we can have a discussion about whether you think a um, recreational trail is, is serving the same purpose as a sidewalk or not, but a um, little snapshot of that. Um, and certainly around the country, we have been seeing, um, this is not unique to St. Paul, we have been seeing increases in our rates of pedestrian crashes. Um, so these were all uh, key concerns um, uh, among St. Paul's leadership and wanting uh, tools to address these issues in terms of um, how do we replace our sidewalks more efficiently, how do we close gaps, how do we address safety. Um, and then just a little bit, not again, not surprisingly, this is a snapshot of um, how St. Paul commutes. This is our best measure of uh, ACS data of how folks get around with um, you know, 80% traveling to and from work by car, and then then you compare that, uh, sorry, walking and by, um, other, which is primarily transit, is about 18%. Then you compare that to deaths and serious injury crashes, um, where we see that um, that 18% of people walking jumps to 28%. Um, so again, we know that there's um, an inequity there and an issue in those crashes that we need to address. 
Um, and so my my primary task in um, in the past year has been to create a pedestrian plan for the city. Um, you'll hear some similarities to the work that Emily has has already walked us through. Um, so why have a plan? Um, really, you know, starting out in this role, this is an opportunity to articulate what our values are as a community about walking, and then set policies around them. Um, another big reason um, for having a plan is to promote consistency in how we make choices. I'm sure um, some of the city folks in the room know just how often you might get phone calls saying, can we have a crosswalk at this intersection or this intersection? Um, and not surprisingly, a lot of, um, uh, of work to date in our cities around pedestrian safety has been really reactive and, and it's often based on who we hear from. And so having set policies is a way to have um, transparency in our decisions, it's consistency and that will allow us to be proactive so that we're, um, we're not just addressing who we're hearing from and complaining, but we're making these improvements throughout our community. Um, and another big reason for having this plan was um, the desire to just start conversations in St. Paul and change that culture. Um, again, knowing that we have a driving culture and all the things that um, Max was addressing and, and, and start to show people um, the benefits and the importance of promoting safe walking. Some of the outcomes that we're hoping to see from our plan, um, the first build capacity to support safe walking everywhere in St. Paul. Um, so that's really among staff. I work in public works and how we make decisions. It's capacity among our elected officials to continue to um, vote for and fund those decisions. Um, and it's capacity among community members. As I said, um, it's not just about the infrastructure we build, it's about the behaviors and the choices that we make. Identify proactive policies for equitable safety improvements. Um, you know, a big component of, of equity and knowing that um, we're building infrastructure around our city um, and making improvements for everyone is knowing that we're not just responding to calls and known issues, it's that we're looking for um, where problems are before they happen. Um, develop priorities for investments and in walking based on equity and safety. Um, again, I've mentioned that equity is a, is a, is a driving concern among St. Paul's policymakers, and so this is an opportunity to really address that. It's not just about the infrastructure we build, but how we support walking through education, enforcement, encouragement programs. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, this is really a chance to promote and energize the culture of walking in St. Paul, and this is a really, um, having this planning process is a great way um, to start that and talk about it. Um, so a few of the outcomes that I expect will come from our plan. Um, First, we will be developing a map of high priority pedestrian areas in St. Paul. This is an example from the city of Indianapolis. Um, as I said, a plan is a chance to articulate what a community's values are and then set policies around those. And so um, I'll get to our survey and some of the questions we ask people about equity, about safety, about demand, about health, about comfort, um, all these different um, ways we can look at geographic areas and say whether these are priority destinations to walk or not. Um, we can rank them as high, medium, or low, and then we can come up with a map of our city and say um, these are the high priority areas where we need to be investing more in walking. Um, a second uh, deliverable that we're creating through this plan is a flow chart that defines how we make decisions for where we enhance or mark crosswalks. Um, we've really taken a deep dive uh, with our public works staff into um, safety literature that's out there and into best practices from other communities. Um, and what I can say is, you know, the, he the heavy lifting is, is being done for us by groups like FHWA and other cities like Boulder and Portland who have really um, put some criteria on paper on um, whether to mark a crosswalk and how much. Um, the, the heavy lifting is really coming from educating our policymakers about that. And as I mentioned, I think a component of equity is being able to make the same decision replicated um, in every part of town, no matter who calls or no matter who doesn't call. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with, uh, you know, oh, but, you know, we've been hearing about this crosswalk for the last 10 years or, you know, 
there's a senior center across the street. Can't we do something here? Those are all um, those are all values and those are all policy decisions. And the trick is to um, come up with a set of criteria that we can use consistently um, every time we get those questions and educating our policymakers about those. Um, and then some other work products that I hope will come from our plan. Um, one is just reviewing our funding availability and being able to articulate our funding needs. I've already given you a flavor of um, what our current funding uh, levels uh, result in in terms of our ability to repair sidewalks, um, as well as programmatic capacity in terms of what other things can the city do in terms of participate in safe routes to school programs or enforcement of our crosswalk laws. Um, and, and other ways that we can support safe walking um, that currently happen in St. Paul, um, but maybe don't have, um, I would say, defined roles in any um, in anyone's work plan. And so, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we started this pedestrian plan um, in January of this year, and so I'll give you just a little flavor of um, what I've heard so far. I want to talk about the different um, outreach events that I've participated in and, and maybe why I chose this kind of fleet of, of activities. Um, we've really just completed a big outreach push in the um, springtime and then we'll be um, taking the information that we've heard and then developing those deliverables that I listed on the previous slides. Um, so the first two, and I'll um, share results in, the, in later slides, but you know, having an open house and a survey survey, those are, you know, very classic outreach tools and those are really the um, people come to us to give us that information um, and those are important um, and I'll, I'll talk about why in, in later slides. Um, the next set are really uh, opportunities where I went out to community members in St. Paul and asked them about walking. Um, and so I spent the summer of 2017, so realized this was before I kicked off the pedestrian plan, um, <clears throat> I spent all of that summer attending as many community events as I could to hear from people about walking and why walking is important. Um, so some outcomes of that were, first, uh, I was able to just get the conversation started, let people know we were doing a plan. Um, I ended up with over 500 names for an email list um, that now are, um, folks that I can communicate with through the planning process. Um, and <laughs> particularly with St. Paul Safe Summer Nights events, which are hosted by the police department um, in our public parks and are attended by um, primarily um, communities of color. And there's a lot of kids that attend these. Um, this was a great opportunity to talk with folks that I don't anticipate hearing from at a public open house or via a survey. Um, ditto, I think, uh, having kiosks up, I had kiosks in all of the St. Paul 16 public libraries. Um, this is a great way to just passively get some information out about the plan in front of people that they can see. Um, let them know about opportunities to participate and then quick ways to um, leave some input via a, a little dot or a vote. Um, so we can get some more input that way and again to just get the message out to more and more folks about the plan. Um, and then these targeted groups, you know, knowing that um, typically the folks who come to a public open house and um, the folks who typically respond to surveys are not representative of St. Paul's demographics. Um, I really thought about who I didn't think I would be hearing from in the survey and then um, made an effort to reach out to um, the Skyline Towers Housing um, Teen Advisory Council and I did a walk with um, teens from Skyline about what it's like to walk in the Hamlin Midway neighborhood in St. Paul. Um, I went to an ESL class and spoke with a new immigrant group about what their experience is like walking. Um, and I, I wanna say that these are not uh, easy events to set up. Um, so for an example, with the Skyline team group, before I met with them, I um, had a phone call with the building social worker I then went and met with her for about an hour um, and talked about what I needed and what I was trying to do with the plan. She invited me to Skyline's Winterfest um, that was a community festival happening 
um, in the building, and it was there that I met their team coordinator who invited me to the team group. Um, so I want to say, that we, and I also want to say that like every activity that I did with them, like I, I redesigned my questions about what would be interesting for teens versus when I was doing it with um, adult new immigrants. Um, so I want to say that you know we hear a lot about like oh you know reach out to you know different groups and go to them and all this stuff and um, it's it's easy to talk about and and actually doing it myself um, I realized that um, you you have to be prepared when you're entering a new community to really give it give it time and develop those relationships which um, frankly is an advantage of having this role in the city that I can do that in a way that I couldn't say. Um, when I was a consultant working for a city on a plan. And so um, I think being able to do things like that really is the value of having somebody um, in-house and on staff focus on that. So a little bit about what we heard um, with the open house. I just want to emphasize, you know, the real value of an open house is the ability to have in-person conversations. This is a group of people who um, got themselves there and so they're willing to learn more and really become educated about the planning process. Um, and then there were just opportunities that I that I had there that I wouldn't have via um, an online survey. Like I ended up talking to two women who were there because um, they really care about the safety of students walking to school and then they um, ended up volunteering for some of our Safe Routes to School initiatives. And so I think uh, I think um, there really is some, some value in having um, these types of events, even though um, maybe 40 attendees isn't nearly as impressive as our survey responses. Um, it's a different quality of experience that you're having. So then with our survey outreach, um, we're really, really pleased with the number of respondents we had, um, 2,800. We did use Facebook to um, advertise our survey. Um, and so from that, we probably had about 1,000 of those responses came from having our Facebook ads. Um, but that means 1,800 of those responses came from our own outreach at the city. Um, so again, if you recall, I had been talking with folks and gathering emails about the planning process. Um, St. Paul obviously already has you know, Twitter and Facebook accounts and a public information officer that I was working with to put information out about. Um, and so we, we really felt like by the time the survey launched, we had done a really good job of building um, the word in the community about this plan um, and were able to get a great response rate that way. Um, these are just some examples of how once we posted it on our Facebook feeds and asked people to, to share those, um, just some of the things we heard from community members. Um, anyone else who's concerned about safer sidewalks should take the survey as well. If you walk in St. Paul at all, take the survey. And so um, it was great to, to get that help in getting the word out. Um, but I mentioned that in addition to the survey and the open house, I was um, constantly striving to, to bring in additional voices to the process, particularly those I thought would be underrepresented um, in those responses. So I mentioned um, the questionnaires that I had been uh, administering the previous summer. Um, generally, when I asked uh, people about their um, their racial demographics, we heard from about 30% uh, of those respondents were non-white, 25% were under the age of 25. Um, and then just the nature of the police safe summer nights events, they're offering free meals in the park. Um, attendees do tend to trend lower income compared to um, what you'll see in our survey responses. Um, so we were able to use those responses to kind of uh, compare what we heard on our survey and ask if, um, if, if we thought that the survey was representative or um, how we could use responses from other sources to, to fill in our knowledge. Um, so not unlike what you heard from Emily, um, one of the key questions that we asked uh, was, uh, why is walking important to you? Um, and really what we heard is um, top three priorities were to get outdoors, enjoy the fresh air, um, to improve my health or get exercise, and to get to daily destinations like work, school, the grocery store. Um, and we, uh, every survey question 
we broke down based on um, age, race, zip code, income, and here we found that that response was consistent across every demographic variable. Um, we also asked people why they like walking in St. Paul, so a slightly different question than Minnesota walks asked. Um, and what I heard were things like health and recovery from brain surgery, able to get home with winter weather, it's calming and I have no other choice but I like it, to see what's going on. St. Paul is where I was born and raised. I love to walk in St. Paul because it has nice people and great community. Um, and what I what I like about uh, the responses that we heard is, you know, that value for fresh air and health. Um, we really heard that uh, across demographic groups um, and across neighborhoods. And um, you know, yes, people want to be able to get to daily destinations, and many people need to be able to. Um, but I think that um, those benefits of walking are truly universal and something that everybody is able to enjoy and seek out, and that's a really powerful. Um, I won't go into all of the kind of ways we broke down our findings by demographics, but I would just, you know, encourage any community that's thinking of doing something similarly to do that so that you can see if there are differences in your community by in how people experience um, walking. Um, so, you know, not surprisingly, uh, zip code did make a difference in why people walk. So. In downtown St. Paul, more people walk to daily destinations versus um, in Highway Hills, which is a much uh, more low-density residential area, um, people are more likely to walk for health. Um, similarly, the income responses were also interesting. Um, people with lower incomes are more likely to walk for daily destinations. Another one of our key questions was, what would make walking safer and easier for you? And, and really not any different from what um, Emily heard throughout Minnesota, improving snow and ice removal was the top concern in St. Paul. Um, the survey was released last March, and so I'm sure it was just <laughs> run on everyone's mind. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not um, an important priority. Um, adding sidewalks to streets without sidewalks and improving ways to cross busy roads um, for the next uh, two priorities. Um, again, we always looked at every question um, by mode, or sorry, by um, by demographics, and so uh, this is just an example of one way we look to see if there are differences in um, what people's priorities were based on what what they told us was their primary way of traveling. Um, we also looked by race, and you know, it is interesting to know that um, the top three responses were consistent across racial demographics. Um, but street lighting and adding sidewalks were more important for people of color, and um, you know, that's something to think about. Um, and then Um, the last key question that we asked in our survey is choose the top three locations where it is most important to you to improve walking. So again, our top three were along and across the busy streets, areas of the city that lack sidewalks, and neighborhoods whose residents rely on walking. Um, and you can see that um, each one of these types of responses really corresponds with a value. So I, I had talked about how um, we will be taking these values and identifying community priorities. And so um, neighborhoods whose residents rely on walking the most is a component of equity. Neighborhoods whose residents have the greatest health risk, health. Um, and you can see how uh, we were asking questions um, to get at what types of values do we have and what different places around town do we need to be supporting safe walking. Um, as I mentioned, we were we were breaking things down by demographics and cognition of who we were hearing from and who we weren't. Um, and you know, my my conversations with those targeted groups was an opportunity to um, hear more from folks about um, about their experiences walking and, and flesh out what we heard in the survey. Um, so I have mentioned that uh, personal safety concerns and street lighting were. Um, things that we heard on the survey were higher priorities to communities of color. Um, so when I was walking with the teens from Skyline Towers, um, 
you know, when they talked about personal safety, they were just talking about the walking environment and splitter. Um, they were talking about weird people, those are their terms. Um, and so they're having a much different experience walking, um, you know, than, than someone might who's walking their dog through their residential um, crossing roads. Uh, another another thing I got out of um, this walk is um, if if folks are familiar with St. Paul and can picture Skyline Towers, which is a block from I-94 and is right adjacent to um, the Midway Target, which is one of the might be the busiest Target in the state. Um, so these these teens, you know walk directly across the street to get into Target. Obviously, there's no marked crosswalk there, um, but the driveway into Target probably has more cars going through per day than you know many intersections of St. Paul, but we don't treat it the same way. Um, and so that got me thinking about, um, again, different ways to look at walking that I, that I wouldn't have understood if I hadn't had that experience with them. Um, another thing talking with um, new immigrants is uh, part of their challenge is crossing the street uh, is just understanding the way traffic signals work and what happens with the lights and when I press the button, what is supposed to happen. Um, I asked them how uh, how they get across four lane roads. Uh, I had I was showing pictures of of different streets in their neighborhoods and I asked how they how they get across one intersection and they said I grab my kids' hands and I run fast. Um, and 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 that tells again kind of. What is that experience like when you're out there walking? Um, and then I do want to emphasize, uh, you know, a lot of people have asked me, like, why, why are you talking about like health and fresh air and how great walking is? Well, that's really important to everyone, not just folks who, um, you know, get to walk, but even people who have to walk um, really value uh, what they're getting from walking. Um, so some next steps for St. Paul is um, our next task is going to be um, to take what we've heard and use that to create priorities for our city. Um, and so I have kind of shown you how different questions that we ask on our survey relate to different potential priorities. Um, and it's going to be the task of our steering committee um, to weight these. And um, we'll be weighting them based on the input that we've heard from the public. Um, and then potentially putting our thumb on the scale on particular priorities if um, if perhaps we think there are um, priorities that were important to our underrepresented groups perhaps that weren't mentioned in our survey that we need to um, to wait or sorry that didn't respond in our survey that we need to wait higher. Um, and then the outcome will be we will be creating um, different maps based on um, so if equity is our regional um, concentration of poverty, um, health is uh, for one particular measure is rates of obesity, um, rates of heart disease, um, we can layer those together um, and create an overall um, map of high priority pedestrian needs areas in St. Paul. Um, so that's really the phase of the plan that we're launching into this summer, um, and then we hope that we'll be able to adopt it by this winter. Um, and then lastly, since, you know, Phil has asked, uh, what do you do as, as a pedestrian safety advocate in St. Paul? Um, as I said, the pedestrian plan is my, my primary focus, but um, within a year, I've, I've found plenty of other things to do, and there will be plenty to keep me busy even after that plan is adopted. Um, so just some examples of, of other things that I can do in this role, um, getting involved in project level decision making, and reviewing plans and designs for road projects um, to make sure that we're including pedestrian uh, friendly elements whenever possible. Uh, data collection and management has been um, a big lift. I'm really proud to say that I now have a GIS shape file of gaps in our sidewalk network um, that we didn't before I started, and that is why I can give you a number, and that's why we can now do future analysis on where those gaps are and how they relate to schools or how they relate to concentrated areas of poverty, and you know, the sky's the limit once you have the data, um, and I would encourage other communities to, to work towards creating that. Um, St. Paul Police have a phenomenal program called Stop For Me. It's a community partnership 
um, where the police actually go out and enforce Minnesota's crosswalk laws and um, issue tickets to drivers who don't stop for pedestrians. And so, um, doing a lot of work to promote and grow that program, working with safe routes to school. Um, next up is a sidewalk plan to talk about where we can invest um, in replacing our sidewalks and, and be more proactive with that. Uh, I would love to do some research into our crash data, but it's going to have to wait. Um, and then just trying to stay abreast of best practices and, and bringing those to my colleagues in public work so that, um, that we can always see what other communities are doing related to pedestrian safety and to bring that to safety. So um, with that, I will happily take um, any questions. Um, I, I know my question is how, how does it feel to be in the public works that I presume has dozens of sort of road, road maintenance, um, um, yeah, the roads people, how, how's that relationship? <laughs> Are you the accepted co-equal or the um, new person <laughs> in the department? Um, this position, I feel really fortunate, had, uh, had really strong support from St. Paul's elected officials, from public works leadership, from community advocates in St. Paul. Um, and frankly, the response that I have heard from my colleagues is more like, oh, we're so glad somebody can address that. You know, we've been wanting to do something about this for a long time, and, and now we have more capacity. Um, so I, I live in St. Paul. I know the structure is kind of devastated all green infrastructure, but um, I'm, I'm wondering, is, that, is there any look at permeable surfaces to help reduce that? Um, yeah, I mean, our sidewalk crew will probably have some strong opinions on that. So, uh, we have permeable pavers downtown, um, and they take a lot of maintenance. Um, and as Emily was saying, it's that balance between you know, better stormwater infiltration, but um, a lot of those bricks have to be, you know, pulled up and replaced each year um, to keep the sidewalk surface flat. And certainly with our um, evolving understanding of our obligations and, and needs to keep our infrastructure usable for people with disabilities and, and to keep those flat surfaces. Um, the pavers have been always nice and snow a lot. So sure. Then, yeah. yeah. Yep. And what's the likelihood that I mean with six to eight miles transition <laughs> that you could even tackle Well that's that's a great question is um we, so the way that St. Paul um, repairs residential roads, the city is broken up into grids, um, and then uh, we kind of move through, I forget how many kind of grids per year, but it, it creates this cycle. And we had to have this idea of maybe that would be how we would address our sidewalks, but um, on, on the amount that we're able to do each year, like you would have to have a grid with like, <laughs> Where's this thing? Um, so certainly this is a concern that is very much on the minds of our elected officials and our, our leadership in, in addressing. Um, and and it's, a, it's, it's not for lack of desire, um, it's for lack of funding and we continue to look for ways to, to find funding. To, um, does St. Paul own the sidewalks or do uh, the residences own the sidewalks? Um, sidewalks are in public right of way, so the city owns the sidewalks. Um, like many communities, um, the obligation to snow, uh, to plow snow or, and shovel is... is but the actual replacement is up to the city thing? And there's no assessment? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, the assessment policy uh, has changed in the last year, um, and I can kind of go into the nuances of that. No, no, I'm just curious. I mean, if you want to get a new sidewalk, you can buy your own, right? You don't have to have the city public works do it, or can you? Uh, no. It, it, it's public done. Public works has to do it? Yeah. Okay. I, I think in Minneapolis there was a, a choice of going out and 
hiring your own yep. contractor or 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 arranging with your neighbors, but it was definitely cheaper to have the city. But yeah, so in in St. Paul, the the costs are borne by the city. In Minneapolis, the cost is assessed 100% to the homeowner, which is why um, the homeowner who's paying 100% of the cost can choose to have it done by the city or to seek their own. Right. Yeah. Yep. So you mentioned the uh, police department and how they're doing with our own. Can you speak a little bit more to the culture of that? Is it really, you know, looking at reducing gentry and staff? Or is it really, you know, I you hear St. Paul Police Department really taking an initiative in that action compared to many of our other communities in Minnesota. And so what was it that kind of drove them to wanting to work on this issue? This was really a community-led initiative. So it started with um, community volunteers doing crosswalk awareness events where they would they had a banner that said, stop for me, and they would walk through crosswalks during rush hour to raise awareness to drivers that they are obligated to stop for crossing pedestrians. Um, and then it involved, evolved that our police department got involved and they were able to issue citations to drivers um, who don't stop for pedestrians. Um, so currently, um, the, the officers themselves are, are walking through the intersections and they actually have um, cameras so that they can document kind of where um, drivers are, but the intersections that they go to um, are based on community member requests. The questionnaires you said you did and the survey when you put all the demographic um, people in terms of top responses um, across both. Um, what is sort of the ultimate goal for the city? Is there, is there a specific policy that the city has in the material city? Um, what? Um, certainly, uh, being more equitable in where we make sidewalk and crosswalk improvements is one of the primary desired outcomes. Certainly, increased safety and reduced rates of pedestrian crashes and deaths. Um, we are actually just at the point with our steering committee where we're um, articulating our vision for St. Paul. Um, still draft, but um, the language that we're, we're working with right now is to be a safe and appealing city for all. Any other questions? Are you the one doing all the data crunching and GIS stuff? Or? We do have assistance from consultants for the GIS. So Dan is asking a question for Max. Um, does he have any suggestions on how to work with local public work staff to address concerns that movable chairs and tables in public spaces will be stolen or destroyed? Yep. Uh, yeah, we get this question every single time we uh, recommend putting out movable tables and chairs. Oh, do you want me to oh, no, just talk a little I louder think, if you can. Yeah, yeah. I think we're... Uh, do you want me to come up there? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, the reason why we... Uh, first off, the reason why we recommend movable tables and chairs is the very reason why you all experience it like you were able to move it around. The utilization of a movable table and chair, a, a, a thousand percent more than a bench or something that's fixed, the price per movable chair is about a tenth as much as like a, like a Victor Stanley sort of like bench as well. Um, and uh, if you do the process right, and we also find putting an invitation on that chair of like, please sit here courtesy of your community, the business, the parks association, et cetera, um, discourages theft and is very welcoming. We put these chairs in downtown Robbinsdale, downtown Minneapolis, uh, downtown St. Paul in a very, in, in one of the, what was perceived to be one of the highest crime areas in downtown St. Paul, and have had very little theft issues in any of those 
facilities. Um, yes, it can be nice to lock them up at night. Partnerships with businesses or other organizations are a great, great, great way to do that. Also, if you're nervous about it, huge believer in pilot projects and tests, go to a hardware store, buy some $20 plastic Adirondack chairs, put them out. The worst thing that happens is you'll be out $100 or $150, and you'll have learned something tremendous. So figure out what people are comfortable with, 